Ezekiel chapter 1, verse 1. In my thirteenth year, in the fourth month of the fifth day, while I was among the exiles of the Kabar River, the heavens were open, and I saw visions of God. On the fifth month, it was the fifth year, the exile of the King Jehoiachin, the word of the Lord came to Ezekiel the priest by the river in the land of Babylonians. There the hand of the Lord was on him. Verse 4, you all there? I looked and saw a windstorm coming out of the north. Let me run that through one more time. (laughs) I looked and saw a windstorm coming out of the north. An immense cloud with flashing lightning and surrounded by brilliant light. The center of the fire looked like glowing metal. And in the fire was what looked like four living creatures. In appearance, their form was human, but each of them having four faces and four wings. Their legs were straight. Their feet were like those of a calf that gleamed like burnished bronze. Under their wings, there were four sides, and they had human hands. All four of them had faces and wings, verse 9, and the wings of one touched the wings of another. Each one went straight ahead. They did not turn as they moved. Their faces looked like, I want you to say looked like. He says like a lot, and he's not from Southern California. He's trying to describe something that's indescribable, but he does his best. Their faces looked like this. Each had four Each had the fore and the face of a human being. And on the right side, each had the face of a lion. On the left, the face of an ox. Each also had the face of an eagle. Such were their faces. Each had two wings spreading out upward, each wing touching that of the creature on either side. And each had two wings covering its body. Verse 12, each one went straight ahead. Wherever the spirit would go, they would go. Let's say that together. Wherever the spirit would go, they would go without turning as they went. The appearance of the living creatures was like burning coals of fire or like torches. Fire moved back and forth from among the creatures. It was bright and lightning flashed out of it. The creatures sped back and forth like flashes of lightning. As I looked, the living creatures were in verse 15. I saw a wheel on the ground beside each creature with its four faces. This was the appearance of the structure of the wheels. They sparkled like topaz. All four looked alike. Each appeared to be like a wheel. And there's like again. Like a wheel intersecting a wheel. As they moved, they would go in any one of the four directions the creatures faced. The wheels did not change direction as the creatures went. Verse 18 Their arms were high, pardon me, their rims were high and awesome, and all four rims were full of eyes all around. Now, if I've lost you, I'm going to bring it home, so just hang in there, all right? Come on, bump your neighbor and say, hang on. When the living creatures moved, the wheels beside them moved. When the living creatures rose to the ground, the wheels also rose. Verse 20, Whenever the, wherever the Spirit would go, they would go. And the wheels would rise along with them because the Spirit of the living creatures was in the wheels. I want you to go down to verse 25. There came a voice from above the vault over their heads as they stood with lowered wings. Above the vault over their heads was what looked like a throne of lapis lazuli. And high above the throne was a figure like that of a man. I saw that from what appeared to be his waist up looked like glowing metal. As if full of fire. And that from down he looked like fire. And brilliant light surrounded him, like the appearance of a rainbow in the clouds on a rainy day. So was a radiance around him. 
This was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. When I saw it, I fell face down, and I heard a voice, one speaking. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word. It's a lamp and two feet light upon our path. I pray that you would give us living understanding tonight that the effects of this service would be far-reaching even to eternity, that you would touch every heart, every man, every woman, every child would be brought low, and you would be glorified, you would be magnified. Come and speak to us. Would you ask God to speak to you tonight? Speak to us tonight, God. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. This is a profound passage of Scripture In the context of what's taking place, a new power had risen in the world. Anybody know what power that is? Babylon. And Babylon had built an army. Now, we do have notes coming around, so I'll just pause for a moment until you get those fresh off the press. There comes moments in life that never come again, although we'd like to have second, third, and fourth chances. Anybody ever heard that before? Well, God's the God of the second chance. I'm so glad. I think he's given me 100 at least. But there are moments that when they come, you're not promised that that'll come ever again. The, the, the Greek for that, the Koine Greek is kairos. There's kairos moments. It's, it's, a, it's where time and destiny cross, and they never come again. This is a moment tonight, February 16th, year 2022 of our Lord. It'll never come again. It'll pass on. God's outside of time. You and I are inside time. And this text is so profound to me for a lot of reasons. And let me in the introduction say that Babylon is a new power. They had taken captives. Another another Jewish young man they took captive. Anybody know his name? His name is Daniel. And Ezekiel has been taken captive. And he's there in Babylon. And it's not good. It's very, very difficult. And in fact... He's been taken captive really for no failure of his own, but for the failure of the fathers that went before him. And Israel had been apostate, and they've been sent off into exile, as was prophesied by what some would call Crazy Jerry, Jeremiah the prophet. The weeping prophet prophesied, oh, they're coming. And all the lying prophets, they said, no, it's all good. Jeremiah said, it's not good but it's going to be all right because you're going to come back and re-inhabit this, inhabit this place and build houses again and God will restore you. But it's going to be 70 years. This is the time period through which this text is written. And Judah was in the middle of this whole thing. And ultimately, Nebuchadnezzar, in March 16th, 597, Jerusalem fell to Nebuchadnezzar, the Babylons. And so Ezekiel is from a priestly family and he's brought into captivity. You know how old he is? You can study this and I, I just don't want to put you to sleep a little bit. You know, one of the keys, one of the, one of the very important aspects uh, or responsibilities, I should say, that I have, that we have as pastors, as leaders, as teachers, as preachers, is to teach you the word, but to preach it to you in such a way that it empowers you to take it home and have a life change. If all you do is have some theological you know, platitudes that are spouted out to make you think I know something, which I, I don't know that much. I've gone back into school to get my degree at night, my spare time, and I'm finding the more I learn, the more I realize I don't know very much. And so as I've been digging into the Old Testament and going through language and scripture and just praying and meditating and writing papers. And I, I, I just realized, my gosh, if somebody doesn't take this and distill it and bring it to some gems and pearls and truth that you can take home, then what good is it? I could sit here and go on to read you some of my textbook. That's not going to help you. But the context is important and studying like that is important. You should love the Lord with all your heart, with all your... Some of you have a lazy mind. How do you know? Because mine, mine's been lazy. I know. You start applying it, realize you've got bigger bandwidth than you might realize. Come on, I want to worship the Lord with all my mind, with all my heart, with all my strength, with all my soul, with all of me. So as you study this out, you see Ezekiel is 30 years old. He's the age that would have qualified to be a priest, right in your notes. 
He's the age you will have qualified to be a priest. Priests were made priests at 30. They prepared up to that point. Then Jewish tradition and law tells us they would become priests at 30. You know when Jesus started his ministry? 30. So here he is. He's a priest, but he's, he's how many know he's not doing his priestly duties? That's not what's happening. He's a slave. He's by some river. And he's in a faraway land through no real fault of his own. Has anybody ever been in a situation where you were swept up into it and you really didn't have much to do with it, but there you were by the river. There you were, the effects of someone else's failure. That's, that's Ezekiel. The actual date is July 31st. 593 BC. And what's amazing about God's word is that it's not some, nobody got any golden glasses with tablets that you can't find. Come on, somebody say amen. It's based on the word of God and archaeological evidence that, by, that, that completely supports the whole thing. The word of God never contradicts itself. And if you find a place that it contradicts itself, it's only because you're uneducated and you don't really know what it's saying. And a lot of people just want to say, well, it's just written by man. It's really, really, because it is written by God. You're going to have to change your stinking life. Come on, somebody say amen. Israel, uh, pardon me, Israel, I could say Israel, but Ezekiel here is not forgotten. He's not forgotten by God. He has a revelation. And I want to say this to you in your hearing. God has not forgotten you. I don't know what you're going through. I don't know what you're in the midst of. I don't know what you just came out of. I don't know what you're heading into. I just know this, that God is on the throne. The devil has been defeated, and he's not forgotten you. He knows your frame. He knows you're rising up. The psalmist says he knows you're setting down. Come on, somebody say, I'm not forgotten. You're, you're carved in the very palm of his hand. It's an encouraging thing to know that God knows me. He knows my name. Remember that song? He knows your name. It's written by a man, and I can't remember. I'm just pulling it out of my spiritual hat. That song was written by a man, a young man who went on a mission trip who was ministering to all these orphans who didn't have names, basically. Nobody knew their names. There's hundreds of orphans. And he comes back to his missionary place that he was staying, and he's weeping, and he's crying, and he's like, Lord, nobody knows their name. And he said, I know every one of their names. And he wrote that song, He Knows My Name. It's a beautiful thing. Come on, raise your hands to heaven and say, He knows my name. Yeah, he does. He knows your name and has not forgotten you. Verse 3, the hand of the Lord was upon him. And I emphasize this, the amount of times he says like, 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 was like this, was like that. How do you describe, if you went to the some place where they've never seen an airplane or some place where they've never seen I don't know, a bulldozer. And you went to a village or you went to a, a, a third world place out in the bush where, they, where they, had, you know, they had no cars. How do you describe a car? Come on, how are you going to describe a car? Go ahead and describe a Tesla to me right now. I mean, what does that look like? Well, it's about, you know, it's about this big and, 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 and it's, it, it's got metal. What's metal? It's this hard stuff. And has wheels. What's a wheel? Well, it kind of looks like this. And it rolls. And you plug it in. And it gets like 1,000 miles to the gallon. Or 1,000 or miles to the whatever. I don't know, the kilowatt or whatever it is. I don't know. I mean, how do you describe a Tesla? How do you describe a bulldozer to somebody who's never seen one? How do you describe a plane, an airplane? You see the bird? It's like that. But it's not breathing. Well, it has these things, like the bird. If you would stretch a bird out, it has these wings. And, and air goes over the top, and, and it's a, it carries people. I mean, it's like, it's like, it's like that's what he's doing. He's, he's trying to express what he's seeing, which is beyond anything he's ever seen before. He's experiencing the glory of God, and he's trying to describe it. God comes to him in verse 4 as I looked and I saw a windstorm, wind. 
coming out of the north. And to me, I, I paused on purpose because there's the glory of God that's going to come out of the north. It's come out of the south, come out of the east, certainly, like lightning seen from the east to the west. The glory of God is being put on display through people who are hungry and thirsty and desperate. He's not forgotten us. He's not forgotten America. You've missed a great place to say amen. He's not forgotten the nations. He's not forgotten Israel. God's on the throne. He's doing something great. And he wants to illuminate us. He wants to open up our heart to an encounter with him that we've never had before. I don't know to what degree you've experienced God's love, God's power, God's word, God's truth, God's spirit. I don't know what degree you've experienced it. I just know all of us can experience more and that God has something for us tonight and something for us this weekend and next week and the week after and the week after that. Not to a oh, ho-hum, bored Christianity, but a Christianity that's filled with like, like, I don't know how to say it. Because that's a, a description of the glory of God. What is your life like right now? Like? What is your walk with the Lord like right now? What's the greatest encounter you've ever had with God? I learned this. I learned that, that whatever degree of impact God has had on your life, if you'll get hungry and thirsty, he will touch you in direct proportion to the hunger that you have. And I've found myself at times waning in my hunger. Waxing, that's increasing. Waning is decreasing. I've found myself at times getting busy, getting weighed down by the cares of this world. He said, he said, cast all your cares on me. It was a pretty sweet dance step. Did you guys see that? <laughs> cast all your cares on me, for I care for you. I found that I've carried cares at times where he didn't want me to carry, and he wanted to show me a, dis, a, a side of his presence, his power, his word, his glory, if you will, but I wasn't ready, I wasn't hungry, I was apathetic, I was consumed with the things of the world, perhaps. Ezekiel is describing this fire, this wind, this cloud, verse 4, the center of fire looked like glowing metal. Anybody ever seen that? Glowing metal. It really reminds me, I mean, Ezekiel 10 starts talking about cherubim. He sees in verse 6 cherubim, but this, this section here, verse 4, reminds me of Acts chapter 2. They were there gathered together when the day of Pentecost had fully come in this upper room, and a wind blew. It reminds me of creation where the Spirit of God hovered over the waters. God wants to hover over us and do something that we've never seen before. Oh, I know you've probably laughed maybe and rolled around for hours in the joy of the Lord. And I'm, 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 I, God's touched me that way and may he touch me that way again. God, I've, I've wept, I've cried, I've seen things. I've had experiences in God that are beyond my understanding. I wouldn't know how to describe some of those things to you, but I, but I might attempt it at, towards the end of the service. But I know that God wants to do something in me, something in you that you've never had happen before. Verse 6, four faces, four wings. I mean, this is like, this is intense. Face of a man, face of a lion, face of an ox, face of an eagle. Scholars say the man, the face of the man is a picture of dignity and majesty. Face of a lion is a picture of, what do you think about when you see a lion? What do you think about? Ferocity. I think of the lion of the tribe of Judah. What else do you think about? Power. I think, uh, I think, run, you know. <laughs> Lions, pictures attempting to describe what he's seeing. In the face of an ox, it's a picture of prosperity. An ox, an animal that works and brings in the harvest. Of the eagles, what do you think about the eagles? Majestic. I mean, here in the United States, I mean, now in this, in this age, eagle, you think uh, America. But, but, but I'm, I don't think he's thinking about America right here. But it, the eagles are amazing. You watch them and watch them soar. He's, he's giving this description. And these the cherubim, amen, G, the cherubim expressed a picture of God's omnipotence. Omnipotence. He's all-powerful. Come on, someone. You know what I'm talking about? God is, God is not in a fight with the devil. That's called Zoroastrianism. Well, the devil, the devil and God are fighting, and then the Lord's going to win one day. One day the Lord's going to win, but that's quite a fight right now, and we just got to pray the Lord doesn't lose. Can I just news for you? 
The devil and God is more like a boot and an ant. God would be the boot. And the devil would be an ant. He's a created thing, and he's serving a purpose. And, and things are playing out. Some of you are so afraid of the devil. Listen, don't be afraid of the devil. Draw near to God, and he'll draw near to you. Know that the Lord is absolutely in control of every infinitesimal de detail of your life. He knows you. Come on, someone say, God knows me. And he's not forgotten you. Say, he's not forgotten me. All-knowing, this all-knowing aspect. The movement of these cherubim, verse 21 and verse 12, each one, it's interesting, they move, but they don't seem to move in accordance with the way their wings, wings flap or anything. I thought about illustrating what this would look like. So I've asked Pastor Josh to help me tonight. Pastor Josh... <laughs> So, I'm going to try. I should have thought this through, but I'm going to go for it anyway. So, if I'm flying, right? If I'm flying and I'm a bird, I'm like, this would be the head of a bird. I'm flying. I'm obviously moving this way. How many of you know you've never seen a bird go backwards, except for maybe like hummingbirds, because they can change the angle of their, their wings. These creatures are so supernatural, they're flapping their wings, but they, they move the way the spirit would move. So they're flapping, but they're not going in any particular direction. They're, they're, they're moving around by the leading of the Spirit. The Spirit of God is directing them. They're not really controlling where they're flying, it seems. It's kind of amazing. Within A wheel within a wheel. I remember years ago, um, I don't think you've ever heard this story, Pastor Josh. I was, I was pretty new to our church. And I heard about these life groups, these small groups. And uh, I was invited to go to one. And they said, you need to come. It's, a, it's an exciting time because we're multiplying one small group, life group, into two. And, and, and Dr. Morocco's coming. It's a time of celebration, you know. And I thought, really? So I get to eat, you know, dinner with Dr. Morocco. I thought, what a deal. Let's go. Because to me, and he still is, he's, he's one of my heroes. Great, great man. And, you know, I used to be afraid of talking to him because it was like Jesus in shoe leather. He would look at me, look through my soul, and see all of my issues. <laughs> so I remember going to this life group, and, and really life groups, small groups, are the best way to get disciples. Roy Stockstill, at 100 years old, in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, at, at a church there, was visiting, and he got up at 100 or something, and he said, the best way to get, it was much slower than that. The best way to get discipled is in a small group. I heard that, and that is how I got discipled. I'm still being discipled, but I went to this small group, this life group. Some call it a cell. I went, there was all these people, and Dr. Morocco shared, and then we ate. How many of you like eating? So... I don't know. I, I felt like I was like one of those guys that's trying to get close to the, you know, the, you know, the, the famous person. So Dr. Morocco's in line. I'm like, what's up? Get, get, cut the person in front to get next to Dr. Morocco. He's filling his plate. I'm filling my plate. I'm like, hey, doctor. So, oh, hey. And so we get down. We go sit down. I go, I, there's other people wanting to sit down. I'm, I'm way more pushy. You know, so I was able to sit next to him. Oh, yeah. I sat next to him, and we're talking, and people are asking him questions, and I'm just listening. I'm thinking, I want to ask him something about the book of Ezekiel. And so there's a pause. I said, Dr. Morocco. He said, yeah. I said, you know Ezekiel 1, where there's a wheel within a wheel? He's like, yes. I said, that's a flying saucer, right? <laughs> UFO? It's a UFO, right? And he's like. <laughs> he didn't laugh. I mean, what's self-control? <laughs> no. He didn't do that. But he said, no I, no, I think that's an expression of the glory of God. I'm like, yeah, yeah. Amen. <laughs> you study this, this wheel within a wheel, it appears that there's jewels. Kind of amazing. I mean, the, the, the throne is this, I hate to call it a show, but it's filled with light, filled with sound. 
When God comes, the glory of God, none of us have experienced the fullness of it because we'd all be dead. You have to have a glorified body to experience the fullness of it. Turn to Psalm 18. Smoke went up from his nostrils, verse 8. And devouring fire from his mouth, coals were kindled in it. He bowed the heavens also and came down with darkness under his feet. This is Psalm 18, verse 10 now. He rode upon the cherubim and flew upon the wings of the wind. He made darkness his secret place. His canopy all around him was dark waters and thick clouds, the skies. Verse 12, from the brightness before him, his thick clouds passed with hailstones, coals of fire. The Lord thundered from heaven. We don't understand God like that. We don't understand an experience like that. But I do believe that we're heading into something that we've never had before. I want to stretch your understanding to tell you that God has not forgotten about you and God has more for us in 2022 than we've ever seen before. The word of the Lord for 2022 is press on. Come on, somebody say, I'm going to press on. I'm going to press on. Sound, the sound is described. Many waters. Voice of El Shaddai. Uh, voice of Shaddai, pardon me, thunder. Relating to Exodus 19, 16, the voice of an army or a tumult. Glory has a sound. Let me say that again. I try to get out of my shacket. How many of you know what a shacket is? Thank you so much because that would have been difficult. A shacket is like a jacket, but it's a shirt. So it's called a shacket, apparently. It's trending. That's what my daughter tells me. Amen. Glory has a sound. Glory, the glory of God has a sound. There's a sound. There's a sound that comes from heaven. It's actually that which impacted me more than about any other. I, I have to be careful of how I say that. But I've heard the sound of heaven at some, to some degree, and it altered me. There's a sound. Pastor Shannon, you were there. Pastor Josh, you were there. You guys were in high school. See, what, how old are you? Never you mind. <laughs> heard the glory of God. I heard innumerable singing. You heard like a four part harmony? Five, you ever heard a five part harmony? How about like an innumerable part harmony? That's what I heard. I've never been the same since then. You see, in actual fact, when, when God touches you and opens your eyes to his power, to, to who you are in this day, in this hour, when he opens you, your heart and he touches you, you will never be the same. Somebody said, well, how do you stay on fire? I, I, I've got disciplines and I, I think we should have them, but most of my Christian walk is passion driven. He touched me. I can't deny it. I'm, I'm, I'm desperately in love with him. I can't go back. I won't go back. What are you, you going to go back to? Go back to what? Some cheap substitute? Go back to uh, the spiritual harlot? There's nothing like his presence. There's nothing like it. Glory has a sound. There's this crystal platform back in your notes. Angels seem to be held upon as this throne of lapis lazuli, which is a royal blue. And there's this glowing figure, like a man. Verse 27. I saw from what appeared to be with his waist up that looked like glowing metal as of full of fire. And that from there down he looked like fire. Brilliant light surrounded him. appearance and the likeness of the glory of man. God is clearly speaking to us, and I'm going to say it so simply tonight. I'm not sure what will take place of the rest of the service. You know, I'm 
you've been coming here for any length of time. I just want God to come himself and lay hands on every one of us and that we'd all be jacked up under the pew, forever changed, and service would go on infinitum and blend right into the conference and all that. I, I don't want to, I'm not going to fabricate something. I'm going to try to push something and make something happen. I just know that the word of the Lord for us tonight is that he's not forgotten you. He's not forgotten your family. And he has this incredible plan to reveal his glory to you, and you won't know anything to compare it to. I can't describe to you what the sound of heaven was like for me. I could try. There's moments, my worship team, we, you all know, I'm, I'm constantly like, sing something else, you know. <laughs> sing something. Change the keys. See, I'm, I'm constantly looking, constantly looking for God to, for us to sync up with glory, sync up with the worship of heaven. I'm going to tell you, when, when you forget about your burnt toast and you, you know, living your best life with your avocado salad, you forget about that and all of the likers and all of the haters and you put aside the things of time and tradition and you get hungry and you realize the only one that can satisfy you, the only one that can fill you, the only one that can change you, the only one that can meet your need, the only one that can take out the heart of stone and put in the heart of flesh, the only one, the only one that can do it. His name is Jesus, and he beckons you to come to him. And so oftentimes he's trying to give us things that we're holding on to our Snapchatting, Instagramming, face-planting life. I said face-plant on purpose. What God is doing in the earth is he's, he's filling his church with the glory of God. He's building his church, not on human wisdom or entertainment. Oh, I know there's those out there with human wisdom and entertainment. But that, that's not how he wants to do it. He wants to pour out his spirit on his sons and his daughters. He wants to pour out his glory. He wants to pour out over us. C.S. Lewis said, we're so consumed like a little boy in the slums playing with mud, making mud pies and castles out of dirt and mud. When is offered to him a vacation by the sea, but he can't believe it, he can't see it, and he doesn't know it, so he settles for the vacation at the mud pie. And thinks that this is just great fun, playing in the mud, when infinite joy, pleasure, freedom, a banqueting table is set before him by God himself. But he can't imagine it. He can't see it. So he doesn't let go of the mud pie. He doesn't let go of the, the mud puddles. Some of you are playing with, playing with Russian roulette with your soul. You're, you're playing with your destiny and your calling and your purpose because you, maybe you've never tasted and seen that he's good. God wants you to experience him. I want you to say that. God wants me to experience him. Ready, set, go. God wants. Facts. Can I spill some tea tonight? God wants you to experience him. Did I say that? Spill tea? Tea is for truth. You know, in Louisiana, we were in Louisiana at this church, and uh, Dr. David Remedios, he sends his love, and uh, what a powerful time we had there. And a, a measure of his glory came down in that place. It was, our church is crazy. No, really, they're, they're, they are extra. Extra. We're just extra. They're extra, extra. They're demonstratively going after God in a way that seems maybe more than the average person. How many of you know that God knows our hearts? So for us to judge because somebody's weeping or crying, God knows your heart, whether you're weeping or crying or whatever your posture is. It's Pentecostals like looking for demonstration, but we don't know what's happening on the inside of people. So don't presume to know. But God does so. And when your hunger, if sincere, when your hunger's sincere, it'll cause you to turn away from the things, as I said, of time and tradition it's okay being when your hunger is sincere to be scorned by maybe even friends or onlookers. 
You don't mind perhaps looking a particular way to be embraced in the arms of a master, to, to receive the robe and the ring, to press in, to, to cross over. God wants you to experience him. His holiness, his wings covered around, all around, coals of fire, picture of holiness, his sovereignty. He can move and do anything at any time. Come on, someone say God's sovereign. What does that mean, pastor? Does what he wants, when he wants to, whoever he wants to. Sovereign, he's sovereign, he's a king. He can make a decision. Of course, he never violates his word, and he's good. Thank God for that. Thank God for God. Come on, somebody say thank God for God. God wants to reveal himself to you and to others. He wanted to show himself to Ezekiel. Why? So he could write the whole rest of the book and so that he could bring hope to the captives in the land and to prophesy a very powerful book for the hour in which we're living. God's with us in the midst of our distress, in the midst of our woes, in the midst of COVID-19 and the Omicron or the Abercrombie or whatever, I don't know what it's called. If we come up with some other name soon, some other variant, we'll overcome that one too. No weapon formed against me will prosper. He will build his church. He's going to build his church. Come on. Thanks for listening to this message today. If the Holy Spirit is speaking to you and you realize that you need Jesus as your Savior, and you'd like to pray with me to either commit your life to Jesus for the first time or rededicate your life to the Lord, Repeat this prayer after me. Father God, thank you for sending your son Jesus to die for my sins. Jesus, thank you for dying for me and bringing me forgiveness. I'm sorry for my sins. I repent of them today, and I ask you to cleanse me and wash me of all my sin. I commit to live for you all the rest of the days of my life, and I pray this in your name, Jesus, amen. If you prayed that prayer today, would you text the word SAVED to 907-357-2065? We'd like to send you some information and some materials that will help you in your Christian walk. God bless.